will be done over at um, what's that? Uh, Steady for life. Steady for life. And we're going to have a Tai Chi class from an uh, actual uh, Chinese person who studied over there. The British Royal, that we had one last time, we're going to have part two. Straight talks about vapes and drugs and recovery alternatives. The Friday Film Festival, we do that once a month. Jennifer Garland is really good. She introduces these. And I think this one's going to be on Roger Front. Robert Mitchell movies. Doing some holiday and uh, birthday card workshops. The gentleman preferred wands is about Marilyn Monroe. Move to music. It's kind of a mini Zumba class. It's not that hard, but we do it here. It's a good exercise class. Let's make a bracelet. Elder Law. Uh, we had this class several times. It's really good about uh, all of your state planning, any issues you could come up with. Creating legacy. We have two classes on genealogy this time. Learning about essential oils, two hundred people, three people of color, mass, 1860. Fix that. Essie's going to do some wines from Italy. Turn, turn, turn is uh, Dr. Steve Jones will do it. He is a naturalist, a forester. He always has excellent programs. Traveling to the stars. I'm very curious about that one, Essie. So it's got to be uh, some rocket scientist just pulled out of the other course. The treasure of the tower is uh, this thing in South Carolina. I've only seen the proposal, but it's quite a story. It should be a very interesting program. Jack of the Beanstalk is a uh, uh, it's a humorous opera. How they going to do that? I don't know. It should be interesting. <laughs> Grandma is on the road again. Mm -hmm. Grandmother got run over by a reindeer. The lady who wrote that. They're going to have an interview with her. What's the Friendship Force? We're going to have a visit to the Children's Advocacy Center. And um, Patients' Rights. Very good for us to know is a lot of us are on Medicare and what are our rights when we get to the hospital. Now, we're also going to have several trips around. Uh, museum Park. We're uh, having a bus that's going to take us down to the Jesse Owens Museum. Uh, Space and Rocket, a guided tour. Learn out what's happening in the background. Tennessee Valley Wine to the wine in Tennessee. I thought that was a perfect country. <laughs> and an architect. Now, we also have what we call 
special interest groups. And these are groups that meet once a week or maybe once a month in some cases. Photography, knitting, uh, youth questers, sorry, are you delaying people? Points corner, computers, cameras, questing, adult coloring, hand and foot, card game, Mahjong, Monaco, uh, Friday hiking, progressive Christian, explored, great conversations. This is a class that Bob Stagg does where they have a specific reading and everybody discusses that particular one. And then I've got a group that meets once a month called Front Porch Conversations, where we pick a subject, uh, could be a controversial subject, and we all talk about it in a friendly, respectful manner. If not, I'll show you how. <laughs> now, um, our rally day, for each session, we have a rally day where we show all the programs you get to meet the instructors. And the one for the fall is going to be on July the 12th from 10.30 to 1 at a new location. We used to go over here to the um, First Baptist Church. Now we're going to be at the JC uh, building uh, down off Airport Road. Big, uh, big space. It should be a real good venue. And we've got two other uh, public programs like this one that are coming up. On June 6th, we've got Frog Busters, uh, which is going to be at the North Huntsville Library. Y'all haven't seen that. They've done a really good job of fixing that up. It used to be an old trailer. Uh, and then on um, the 24th of June, Alabama Speaks is going to be a, about uh, women's suffrage, and that's going to be uh, in this building here. So that's enough for the commercial. Thank y'all all for coming. And I'd like to introduce Susan Bakke, who will introduce our speakers. Hear me in the back of that, right? No, no, no. No, no, no. How far are you? Like right here? Yeah. Okay. We have two speakers today. Kylie Porter, um, you've heard before, and you know Harvey Cotton very well. Harvey, um, we'll start out with Hallie. Kelly began her work with Land Trust 13 years ago as a volunteer working to energize the um, outdoor environmental education for children. And she came on staff shortly thereafter and has been working in the fundraising capacity, therefore, um, for about the last 12 years, passionate about the Land Trust mission uh, of North Alabama's land preservation, always available to talk to you, to groups, whenever you may need them and if you know anything about land trust we really do need them harvey cotton retired 22 years retired after 22 years with the huntsville botanical garden you've probably seen him walking around and giving lectures there he continues to present workshops for garden clubs associations and the lecture across the southeast on various garden topics he is actively working with the Land Trust of North Alabama on their pollinator garden project and will tell you how to incorporate some of those native plants in your very own garden. So, if you will silence your cell phones, please, we'll begin. in my yard, so um, my passion started early for the land and the natural features um, that are similar to what we have here. So I guess my first question for you all is, um, how many of you all are familiar with the Land Trust? Awesome, that's fantastic. And how many of you all are members? 
How could you say y'all? Oh. Yes, you guys. I could do that, and I said y'all. I know, and know it's proper English. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for being members. Um, it is our members that really drive our ability to accomplish our mission, and we really, really appreciate it. So that begs the question: What is our mission? Uh oh, further technical difficulty. You can name the computer. Yep. All right. Okay. All right, we're going to see if we got this. All right, so our mission is to preserve North Alabama's scenic, historic, and ecological resources through conservation, advocacy, recreation, and education. And what we're going to talk about mainly today is just I'm going to give you a general overview of what we do um, and really talk more about conservation, recreation, and education, um, those three key legs to our mission. So we started back in the late 1980s um, with the community, local community effort to save the slopes of Monsena from development. Um, so what started with about a few hundred acres has now grown to over 9,000 now um, in all of North Alabama. Our service area has also grown. Um, we initially started with preserving land only in Madison County and now we've grown uh, to cover the northernmost 10 counties in Alabama that border Georgia, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Um, so the reality is most of our land that's been preserved is in Madison and Limestone County, um, but we are beginning to get land um, throughout our area. We've got land in DeKalb County, Marshall, Jackson, uh, and Colbert. That's going to be a brand new one that we have. So I'm going to talk a little bit about conservation. And conservation, really, when you, when you pull it down super simple, is the protection of something unique or unusual. For us, it is the protection of land um, that has significant or unique features, that may have um, significant or unique species. That could be any species from birds to amphibians. Um, diversity of species on lands. Um, and migratory routes. This picture is actually a cave that is on the land trust property. It is located on our Bethel Spring Nature Preserve. Um, and I don't know if you can see it, but these are people rappelling into the cave and down there. It is phenomenal. Um, so does anybody know how many caves we have in Alabama? A whole bunch. A whole bunch. <laughs> yes. So several years ago, it was 4,250 caves in Alabama. Um, most of those, three-fourths of those, are in North Alabama. We are a global hotspot for caves and cave flora and fauna. So that's why they're important. So one of the things that we're really excited about is we're beginning to step out into areas with the help of educators and scientists um, into developing our lands or conserving lands for specific species um, or types of species. This is Chapman Mountain Nature Preserve. It is one of our newer preserves, and we just got a grant from the Cornell Lab to develop a birding education site um, and viewing site. This is actually a bird blind, um, and behind that blind is going to be a water feature. So, um, and in addition to that, we're working with Alabama A&M on bird banding. And that is a wonderful little white-eyed vireo. He's so cute. <laughs> so this is just absolutely thrilling. For the first time, we are stepping into developing a pollinator garden. And you might say, 
why would the land trust want to do a pollinator garden? Well, most of you probably know that pollinators are on the decline worldwide. And they're on the decline mostly because of habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and also the use of pesticides. So we are working with Harvey on developing a pollinator garden um, right up here at the top of Cecil Ashford. It's a one acre piece of land. So not only does it have an incredible view, but it'll be an educational site where people can come and see what native species of plants look like that you can use at your home to encourage pollinators. Um, we are blessed and fortunate to have a donor who just stepped up and said, I want to make this happen. And so um, they have given us the first donations um, for, the, for this particular project. We should be uh, breaking ground in the next month. So that's really exciting. One of the things that I talked about in conservation was um, habitat fragmentation. Um, one of the things that plants, I mean, that animals need to move is they need a, an intact corridor. We call it a migration corridor. So this project, our River to Gap Trail, um, it's called Trail, but it's really a whole project, um, is from Denham Landing to Levin's Gap. And it's our effort to preserve land all the way through so we have an intact corridor. So we continue to work on that. We've been working on it for five years. We're we'll be beginning to get there. We have a few more connections to make. So um, not only will we have space for trails, but we'll have space for um, animals to move as well. So education, and I threw research in there too. Um, I always say we, we can't preserve or protect what we don't know we have. Um, and a lot of folks don't know what we have here in North Alabama. Uh, North Alabama is ranked number three or four. Well, Alabama as a whole is ranked number three or four uh, for um, biodiversity, meaning we have more species here in Alabama than, what, 96? I mean, 46 other states. That's pretty impressive, and a lot of people don't know it. The other thing that we have is, uh, unfortunately, we're ranked number one or two on the list for species at risk of extinction. So we obviously have a lot of education to do. And how do we do that? We have guided hikes. Um, we've been having those for a long time, but we are now branching out into other areas. We've got camps that are going on. We had our first kids camp this past summer and it was phenomenal. You would be amazed at kids who come out and are so excited to learn when it's pouring down rain. <laughs> and they absolutely loved it. Um, the other thing we're doing is more in-depth opportunities. So opportunities to come out and learn about the flora and fauna for an entire weekend. Those are typically paid opportunities, um, but they become very, very popular. Outdoor recreation. A lot of folks know us for our preserves. We've got eight public preserves. They're open from dawn till dusk, um, free of charge, um, and they're open for just about any outdoor activity you want to do, from walking, hiking, running, mountain biking, and we have two preserves that are open for horseback riding. I love this map because really, anywhere you live in the Huntsville or um, Madison area, you have a preserve, a land trust preserve within about 10 minutes of where you live. Um, and some places you have two or three. So we've got Harbor Square to the north, um, Rainbow Mountain out in Madison, we've got Green Mountain and Bethel Spring in south and southeast, we've got Levin's Gap, Montesano, Chapman Mountain, and Wade Mountain. And each of these are, um, even though most of them protect similar um, features, they can actually be very different. Montesano Nature Preserve is one of the largest urban land preserves in the United States, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we actually have three nature preserves, and all three of them are bigger than Central Park in New York. That's kind of kind of cool to think about. Um, Montesano really is known for um, a lot of the historical features. Um, it connects to the state park, so you can get a, a hike as long as you want. You can start on land trust. Go into the state park and come back. 
Blevins Gap Nature Preserve. Now that is where the pollinator garden is going to be. Um, but there you get, you get one of the best views of South Huntsville on the brand new overlook there. But you can also hike the trails on Blevins Gap and see both Hampton Cove and South Huntsville from the ridge. So it's pretty cool. Green Mountain Nature Preserve is one of my favorites. Um, it is really known for the water and the waterfalls that it has almost all year round. You can hear water. Um, and it also has a Native American rock shelter, which is pretty cool. Harvest Square Nature Preserve is really unique compared to our other preserves. Um, it is flat. It was farmland. Part of it is farmed. But it has two ponds on it. So the activities on that property include fishing um, and kind of exploring the waterways there. It's got some wetland areas created by our friendly neighborhood beaver. So we have beaver dam and beavers, and um, it's a great place. It's one of our smallest preserves, um, but it is extremely popular. It's one of the few places out in harvest that's preserved. Rainbow Mountain is out in Madison. And it's really known for its karst features. If you've been out there, um, it has something called Balance Rock, which is really cool. So if you hike the trails on the top, you really spend most of the time hiking between the little chimneys of rock. Way Mountain Nature Preserve is a little further north. It is one of our preserves that offers horseback riding, um, mountain biking, um, and it's unique. It's got two different ecosystems. So you've got one at the base, which is a kind of a hardwood forest area. And then at the top, in an area called Devil's Racetrack, it is a more arid area. So you've got a different set of plants and things up there. Chapman Mountain Nature Preserve is one of our newer preserves. It has a full service pavilion, which means it has bathrooms and running water. I never knew that bathrooms were so important in getting people out and naked. But apparently it is. <laughs> so th this property has been very, very popular. We have a lot of our education programs out there. Um, and it's unique in that it has a pine area, which has a disc golf course. But you can also hike around it. Um, and it's got an upper area, which is heavily wooded. It's got a lot of history to it. Um, it's really fun. It's a neat place to wander around. Bethel Spring Nature Preserve, this is the preserve that has that huge cave. And you access that cave under that rock, <laughs> which is kind of scary to me. Um, but it has a waterfall that drops down into the cave. It's always wet. Um, I've never seen that waterfall dry. Um, the water runs down through the cave and pops out of a spring at the base of the mountain, um, which is wonderful. The spring is always about 57, 60 degrees, um, and beautiful. We've got a, a hefty amount of aquatic species in there that we're working to get inventory so we know what's out there. Um, that property is also unique that there's a significant amount of farmland around it that is also uh, owned by the land trust but leased by a farmer. We also work with the Greenway on the Greenways with the City of Huntsville. We really work to identify, help identify routes and expedite the process of getting Greenways built to connect communities um, with these pathways. I think everybody's realizing how important having Greenways are um, in city development. So, this is actually an old slide, and I probably don't even need to use it anymore because we can just walk out and see what's happening in our city. Um, long time ago, we used to say, it really is important that we get out there and preserve the land. Well, it's even more important now. We can, we can see what's happening in your neighborhoods. Um, and it's important to have the preserved land to balance out that development. We're not anti-development. We, we just want to balance it out. And people are actually moving to cities that have preserved land and um, trails and ways to get outside. You all can reach out to us at any time. You can go to our website, landtrustnal.org. 
Um, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at, at Land Trust NAL. Um, and we're really a low key organization, as you can imagine. So, any phone call to ask about a trail, a property, to ask about a pollinator garden, or any of the projects that we have going on, we welcome those questions and would love to talk with y'all about them. So, that's all I have. Did anybody want to ask questions before Harvey takes over? Um, and this may be you know, sort of out there, but as we watch Huntsville build, Mm -hmm. We're getting like, looks like miles of apartment complexes. And is there any, does the land trust have any interest or influence in maybe doing some zoning where these apartment complexes have some open land, some green, you know, it's getting to be solid concrete with no, no trees, no, no place for children to play who may live in the apartment. Uh, is there any move at all to do some sort of zoning requirements that would require some green space? So <laughs> that's a great question. So the land trust really doesn't have any um, ability to influence in that area. However, we do work closely with developers, um, especially when they reach out and they want to know if we can to help work with them on developing some green space in their areas. Um, so we do have some of our uh, fingers in that, but we certainly don't influence the city. I will say I think the city is realizing how important it is to have more green space. I am seeing a definite change. Do you have any uh, working partnerships with other uh, conservation organizations, such as the Nature Conservancy? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So the Nature Conservancy, for an example, um, before they were able to hire someone to come up to North Alabama and monitor their properties, uh, the land trust took over two properties. One was um, Keel Mountain. The other was, um, let's see, Whitaker Preserve, which is right next to uh, Paint Rock River, Flint River. Um, and so we help monitor those. We also work with Nature Conservancy and with um, Forever Wild to purchase properties. Um, the land trust is smaller than those organizations, so our pockets aren't as deep. Uh, and so sometimes we're able to work out a situation where the bigger organizations may purchase, particularly Forever Wild, but we may manage. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, under your education site, I think I saw a photo of the archaeologist yes. from, from Ben Hawksburg. Yes. So do you do things in coordination with archaeology? Absolutely. And yeah. you publicize this through WLRH or what do you do so people are aware and can attend? So uh, the most important thing is our education programs fill up really quickly. And one of the benefits of membership is you get first right to hear about activities going on. So I would encourage you to become a member. It's very, um, it's cost $35 a year to be a member. And you'll get notifications on our events and activities before the general public. We also publicize on WLRH, social media, so Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, Twitter, I don't, I don't do Twitter, but I know that our office does. Um, and our, our website is the other place. And yes, we connect with Ben. He does a great job. He's phenomenal. We also work with botanists, and scientists. We've got a herpetologist we work with that does programs. So it's across the board. Okay, second question. Um, Earth Day we just had. So do you do things in conjunction in Encouraging that in the art area, and I was noticing, especially in Thousand Oaks, the 101 freeway in California, they have this huge overpass oh. for animals. That is a dream. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have that. Absolutely. So, as far as Earth Day, we've made a conscious decision not to do an Earth Day type festival because there are some big ones already happening in town. Monsanto does one, Hayes Nature Preserve, and it goes on from there. 
So we support those activities, but we also do some trail maintenance um, and volunteer opportunities for Earth Day. All right. You can't talk to us. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> That has been an ongoing conversation, absolutely. But one of the things we're working very hard to do is to keep from mission drift. And because our mission is to preserve land and open that land, um, either close it because it has unique plants and animals or open it to the public, um, we have chosen not to step into that rehab field. Um, I know there's a need for it here because birds in particular, you have to go down to Birmingham for that. Um, but it's just not something that's kind of in our purview. Because I know the state of Alabama is really, really big for the number of legal rehab or whatever area that I think it was the Germany College that the state. Yeah. And then we have animals now in the museum park. I think the short answer would be probably not. Do I think something would happen in the long distant future? It's possible. I so, uh, just want to say your, thank you for doing this. Your passion comes through loud and clear. It's hard to go, I know. And Larry, our beloved MC back here, we, all of the instructors are passionate about what they do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Work? No. Now try. Does this work? Oh. Yeah. I feel very space man. <laughs> so this works now. Good. A new blue background. I've not seen this yet, so we don't know how once we transfer it over, new things may show up on the screen. Um, thank you for coming out. I'll echo Hallie. It's been a long time since I've spoken in public. Um, COVID really took a hit on all of this, and it's great to see faces and not images on a camera screen uh, in a Zoom call, so to speak, although I do think we have some Zoomers here. So we're going to talk a bit about pollinator gardens, and here's kind of the way I look at it. We'll talk about the importance of pollinators, their threats to their existence, what you can do, and that's the best part about this whole lecture. This is not one of those talks where we've got a real big problem and they're really in the damn thing you can do about it. You can do something about this one. And that's what I find so exciting about working with pollinators. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about Blevins Gap. And then the last thing I always show are pictures of plants. So the end of this are all my favorite plants uh, for pollinators. So the whole subject is about what are pollinators and why do we talk about them? Typically that's birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds, but we also have bats and moths and all types of other things that are there. And the reason is, is there's a threat to them. And just a couple of years ago, Nature Magazine named the bee as the most important species on earth that we have. And it's all because of its pollinating functions. What we're seeing is bee decline. And this really began back in 2006, 2007. I know it's hard for you to see the bar graphs, but essentially these are winter or losses year over year of honeybees. The reason we talk honeybees is we count them. We count honeybee hives. Every beekeeper, and I know there are a couple in the room, has to report each year their numbers to USDA. So that's why you see these figures year over year is that they have been reported to the federal government. We would love to see declines no more than 20%. Unfortunately, those declines are many times over 35%, over 40, some year 50. And this past year, 
for the past what I saw from Auburn, 45.5% peak loss. That's almost unsustainable that we have. That's honeybees. The other side of the story is there are more than 4,000 species of native bees in North America. The honeybee is not native. It was brought over from Europe with the pilgrims, we'll say, came over. They saw a good thing and they wanted to bring it with them, and it is naturalized in North America today. But it is not one of our native species. There are probably 400 native species in Alabama. We don't count them. We don't know how to find them very well. Most of them are solitary. They don't have big hives. But we know because of the other threats that we're seeing, these bees are in decline as well. So we want to make sure we're taking care of them. Now, there are a lot of challenges to honeybee or bee health. We'd love to think there was only one thing. I know when I first heard the term colony collapse disorder, I went, oh, great. They figured out what was the problem. No, they just put a name to it and said, we've got a problem. So let's figure out why it's all happening. And there are a lot of things that are out there. Genetic weakness, nutrition, weather patterns, beekeeper practices, parasites. But they're kind of a big three, if we're going to call it that. And the first one is Varroa mite. And these Varroa mites are in Europe. They're in North America. We don't see them in Australia. And they are not having the problems with bee declines in Australia that we're seeing here. And Varroa mite is probably a big part of that. The second one, and the one that gets probably the most attention, and deservedly so, is pesticide use. Pesticides, specifically insecticides, are made to kill insects. Bees are insects. So we have to be very careful in how we use pesticides so we know we are not harming bees. Unfortunately, the simple answer is, we can't just say, use no pesticides at all in totality, because then we would have outbreaks of other insects that would take over everything. I can say to you, as a homeowner, please do not use pesticides unless you absolutely have to. That is something in our control. And in most cases, you will not need to. There are other efforts you can go through to control a pest without having to go directly to a pesticide. And then lastly, and the one that really gets attention now as we look at it, is habitat loss. Now, the top picture, I know Madison County is growing. I don't ever think we'll look like that. Uh, let's hope not. But the one that I find, and so we think of that and we say, oh goodness, of course there's not green space and forage plants for our pollinators. But the other one we found that bottom left picture is farmland. And you go, well, that's green spaces. It's got plants growing on it. Surely that's going to provide food and nourishment for our pollinators. Well, that particular one is corn. That's the Midwestern United States, especially after ethanol subsidies came in. All this land that used to be fallow was put into corn production. And corn production goes from fence row to fence row, especially with GPS tractors. There's no fallow spaces. And because corn is a wind-pollinated plant, it provides really no nourishment to all of our pollinators. So the bottom left picture is just as much a food desert to a pollinator as the top right. Much less than we get into all the pesticide use we see in agriculture. So what we've realized is that habitat loss and being able to provide the pollinators with the food and nourishment they need, the nectar, that's where we can come in. So we've all now, it's plant a victory garden for the pollinators. There are plenty of resources that you'll find out here on the internet. Um, there's a group called Monarch Watch I kind of interchange between butterflies and bees because in so many ways we, they can be treated the same way as far as nourishment goes. Most plants that are attracted to butterflies, bees are attracted to them as well. 
Hummingbirds can be a little different because of flower shape, but bees and butterflies are fairly interchangeable. Wonderful program, schools get involved with Monarch Watch. Um, Monarch, again, it's habitat loss that we're seeing for the decline in monarchs, both here as well as in Mexico where they go to overwinter. So we kind of got a double whammy there. Uh, the second part is because monarchs migrate, these corridors, as we were talking with the migration patterns, are very important to them, just like hummingbirds. The Pollinator Partnership, Monarch Wings Across America. Pollinator Partnership is a fabulous uh, organization. They put out these guides, planting guides for 33 different regions across the country. You go to their website, put in your, type in your zip code, and it'll come up and give you, we're actually that little part of Madison County and field guide 222. You can download this PDF and it'll give you the list of plants native to your area that attract pollinators. So you can put that in for any part of the country. A couple of years ago, as this really came to a head, and I say a couple of years ago, time flies now, can't believe it's 22. This was probably 2015, 2014. We put together a co collaborative group of people and we created this pollinator garden partnership and the goal was to put in a million pollinator gardens in two years across the country, from as small as a patio garden on your back, you know, a container on your back porch to larger community gardens. And the, it ended in 2018. And I'm pleased to see, I think I have a slide with that. Uh, this was the challenge, plant something for pollinator, register your garden, and then spread the word to others. In 2018, we had a million 40,000 gardens registered across the country. The program is still going on, so I would encourage you to get involved there. It's an excellent resource page if you just put in the million pollinator garden challenge. Five million acres of pollinator habitat, and more importantly, eight million people planting. Much of this was all about outreach and educational outreach to others about the importance of our pollinators and why, what we needed to do. You'll find many resources of what plants to put in. This is a company called American Beauties, uh, Native Plant Collections, and again, they'll do them for each region of the United States. Uh, bee identification guides, and it's interesting now, once you start looking, it really opens up to what you see. Uh, observation is amazing and how many different types of bees that you'll see out visiting your plants. Uh, now the big push, they've had two new books out on wasps and how their effect on pollination is. This is one I just learned from, from Sally, the pollinator pathway, very similar to the million pollinator garden. The idea here is we want to create these pathways of plant material, conserved lands for pollinators as they migrate and go through. So another website where you can register your garden, uh, a grassroots movement transforming traditional landscapes into pollinator way stations. The other part of this is that statement of traditional landscapes. We're seeing a lot of this, this movement goes into sustainable gardening, each of ecological gardening, of kind of taking up what we've always done in the past. Lots of lawn, lots of lawn that we mow and fertilize and spray and mow again, and changing that into a more sustainable landscape with a lot more plant material, native plants, flowers that are there that would be nourishment for the pollinators. A lot of Research organizations have gotten into this to try to see where the problems are. I was very involved in one called the Horticulture Research Institute. We did what was called the GrowWise Be Smart program. Came out with best management practices for nursery growing operations, greenhouse growing operations, landscapers, and then uh, retail garden centers, and then homeowners. Much of that, as you would imagine, dealt around the use of pesticides so that we were doing the correct thing and not harming our pollinators 
as we um, tried to grow our plants. Okay. Ah, kind of have to throw this one up. This is, I guess, the shameless plug. I thought that might be the one he left out. Um, when we wrote the book, this was the book which came out in 2019. That's kind of hard to believe. Uh, bees weren't as much top of mind then. It's kind of interesting. This, as it turns out, was about the time we started having it come up. We wrote the book in 2008. So I was much more in tune to hummingbirds and butterflies, especially being at the botanical garden. We had the butterfly house. And so we looked throughout the book and highlighted those plants that are butterfly and hummingbird nectar plants. Like I say, typically if it's a butterfly plant, it'll also attract bees. And then also the interest in native plants, we use the dogwood symbol as a, a plant that's native to the southeastern region. There are a wealth of Facebook groups out there now. Um, I've signed up for several. This is one called Pollinator Friendly Yards. I would say almost every post now on there is quit mowing your lawn and spraying it with herbicides and let the clover and dandelions grow. Uh, this is gonna be an interesting, um, let's say, turf war between HOA associations and homeowners before too long, uh, because this is really coming out. Another one called pollinate, Pollinator Habitat Protection. And then one I've, I've really enjoyed is Butterflies of Alabama. Uh, we have wealth of native butterflies in Alabama that you'll see out there. Um, so these are all public groups that you can easily join. And then this last one, Save the Bees. So lots of information that comes out through there. Um, do I attest to the veracity of all posts? I would be foolish uh, to do that. But they are things that uh, are interesting to see. So what can you do? And that's really the crux of this. And it's provide pollinator-friendly habitats in your own landscapes. And I'm kind of going to go through a, a 10 point uh, lists that are very easy to put through. And the first one is plant native plants. Now in this, I'm going to point out this is always what we see and it's because of the idea that the native pollinators, the native butterflies, insects, bees, all the things that are around kind of co-evolved with the plants of that area. Therefore, they coexist together. Do they have to be native to provide nectar to the pollinators? No. We've had many studies that have gone through comparing native plants to exotic plants. Do some, do they, one provide more nectar than others? And as you would imagine, depends on the plant. There are some native plants that don't provide a lot of nectar. There are some exotic plants that provide a host of nectar. The one thing we want to make sure of is that we're not planting invasive plants. So native plants, even though they could be considered weedy or uh, a thug of the garden, as some have said, they are not invasive by definition because they're from here. An invasive plant is something that is not from here. We want to choose plants with varying bloom times. The wonderful thing to me about creating a pollinator garden is it's truly what you yourself want in your own garden. You want something blooming from as early in the spring to as late in the fall as possible. You like looking at pretty things in your yard. That's the nectar that the pollinators want. So we want something that blooms from as early in the spring or late winter as possible all the way past frost into early winter because they're going to be native insects and pollinators out there. Typically, um, we see is most of us have what are called spring-centric gardens. There's a very easy reason for that. You go to the garden center in the spring or the botanical garden plant sale, that was two weekends ago, and you buy what's in bloom. That's human nature. We want to again see the thing that's very beautiful sitting in front of us. We're going to plant that azalea in full bloom as opposed to that milkweed that's got two little leaves sticking up out of the ground, barely visible at this time of year. 
We're not going to buy that as much because you're saying, what's it going to grow into? But we've got to make sure that we have something all year long. So we do things, what's great to see are bloom charts and kind of think of your garden as this season long, something coming in and out of bloom. And we'll use trees, shrubs, perennials, all to fill in these gaps. We don't use a lot of annuals because again, we're looking at sustainable gardens, not to say that annuals can't provide nectar, but to really put that garden in place, you want these plants that occur over and over again. You want a variety of plants. Again, think of this as a food buffet. This is a buffet for the pollinators. They'll have their favorites that they'll go to, especially as they come into bloom. The fresh nectar that's out there, they're going to be moving to that. But we want a wide variety for them. We also want, this is one that's been interesting, is one, unfortunately, that we in our industry have caused. Um, and I want you to look at the plant. You look at the one on the far right. That's a classic Echinacea cone flower blossom. It's what we call a composite flower. The petals are in a circle around the male and female flower parts in the middle. It's perfect for pollinators, bees and butterflies. They can land on the petals and they can wander all over that flower to get down to the nectar and get the pollen all over their bodies as they move from flower to flower. Well, we in our breeding work, people love big blossoms. So we've created double flowers, meaning many more petals. So if you look at the two cone flowers on the left and in the middle, those are double echinacea. While they may be very pretty to us, now all of a sudden we've hidden the pollen and the nectar from the bees and the butterflies. Another example of that would be, that's limelight hydrangea, one of my favorite hydrangeas. I'm definitely not telling you don't plant limelight. But if you want a hydrangea for your pollinators, plant the old fashioned panicle hydrangea called Tardiva. It's a very open flower where the bees and the butterflies can get down to where the pollen and the nectar is. Then the last one I'll show you is Camellia. Most of us don't think of Camellia giving us, um, providing pollinator food, but especially if you're down on the Gulf Coast region, many of those naked insects are very active all winter long. They really don't go as dormant because they're not freezing. And so the Camellia blooms on the Gulf Coast, I'm walking through Bellingrath and, and the Mobile Botanical Garden in January, it's amazing how many bees you'll see out on camellia. So the one on the left, that's a double camellia. It's called an anemone flower camellia, where the one on the right is a single. And you can see the stamens and the pistil very per predominantly on the second flower. We want to plant multiples of each plant, large, broad sweeps. It's not spots and dots. You want to give them an area that they can come to and literally pick out, as it were. So think of, I'd rather you use a couple of different plants in broad sweeps than 12 different plants in ones and twos. You'd be much better off there. Make room for larval host plants. And this is especially important with butterflies because they are unique in the sense that they go for nectar plants where they get the nourishment and then they have a plant that they lay their eggs on. And each butterfly can have a unique host plant. We've got a few generalists there, partially in fennel, a couple of our herbs, a lot of different butterflies will lay on. But milkweed is what the monarch butterfly is gonna lay its eggs on. Spice bush, Lindera benzoin, is what the spice bush swallowtail is going to lay its butterfly or butter or its eggs on. So make sure we've got host plants there so that the generations can continue. Most butterflies only live two to three weeks. This is not long-lived plant. So make sure that we've got that out there. And when you see these caterpillars, and this is one of the great things with children, when they find the caterpillar. 
That's almost as much fun as finding the um, adults. The other reason you want to make sure you plant a lot of host plants is that unfortunately, these little critters here, they're worse than babies. All they do is eat and poop. <laughs> they will devour host plants. That's why chefs hate having an herb garden out and then all of a sudden the butterflies come in, lay eggs on their fennel and uh, parsley and others and they go to cut it and it's all gone because the butter, the larval plants ate it up. But they're absolutely beautiful. Choose a sunny spot. Now, the reason we say this is more sun, more flowers. It's as simple as that. A lot of people will tell me, oh, I have a very shady garden. Does that mean I can't plant for pollinators? Of course not. There are many wildflowers uh, and other shade blooming plants that will attract pollinators. But for a really robust pollinator garden, the more sun you can give it, the better. Just you're going to have more flowers there. Create a safe watering spot. This does not mean you have to put in an elaborate bird bath or water feature, but it is an area where even if water collects in rocks um, or put, um, areas with mud, butterflies, this actually is called puddling. They will get right down on the wet spaces and take up water. They really can't drink from a big fountain, but they can from any depressions and rocks, wet spaces, gravel that has been wet. Uh, that's very helpful. And then provide safe havens, places for them to rest. That's why it's important to have layers within your garden, evergreens on the boundary, uh, places where they can go and hide from predators. You won't see them. Um, often used to laugh. You can go buy one of those cute little butterfly houses in the botanical garden gift shop. We'd love for you to do that. It supports the garden. I don't know that I've ever seen a butterfly in there, but doing having an evergreen on the boundary or tree upper layer canopy for them to hide in is very important. Avoid pesticides. Can't say it enough. Observation in your garden, and this is what with pollinators, hopefully that's what we do is we get out in the garden to be able to enjoy this. That allows you to see a problem before it gets out of hand. And in many cases, if you can spot the problem when it's in its infancy, you can take care of it before you literally have to resort to, as we say, the nuclear arsenal. So there are many times you can just remove a plant, remove parts of a plant, spray it with an organic pesticide, something, you know, soak in water, uh, things of that nature. You want to go through that first before you ever have to go. Now, also say there are times when people say, well, why don't you just say ban all the pesticides? There are a lot, I mean, well, the Midwest has been destroyed because of the emerald ash borer. We've deforested much of the native ash trees throughout because of an exotic pest. We have to have something within the arsenal to be able to combat things of that nature that can literally wipe out whole ecosystems. That doesn't mean it's available for every one of us to use indiscriminately. But we don't want it. That's why we have to have them there in the toolkit. But for each of us, we can be very responsible on how we use pesticides. So that's kind of the 10 things you can do in creating a pesticide or pollinator garden. So when we talk about Blevins Gap, you know, I've got actually a couple of duplicates. We saw the vision and, and mission of the land trust. And for me, what makes the pollinator garden so perfect for uh, the land trust is when they're looking at education. Um, and conservation and education, these two fit so well within the mission. Um, and mainly because it is the perfect way to reach children. We saw this at the garden when we put the butterfly house up. The kids react to critters much more so than they react to plants. It's a fact of life. The wonderful part for us as horticulture people is we now get to talk about the importance of plants as we're talking about the critters because the two have to work together. 
You don't have the butterfly caterpillar without the milkweed that it's eating and growing. So that allows us to talk about that. Then the children get a sense of the symbiotic relationships. So that's what's wonderful. When you talk about the monarch, I mean, what an incredible creature. A guy can go from Canada to Mexico in a couple of months. The whole problem is it's five generations that make the trip. One guy doesn't do it. So the guy who leaves Canada and the one that winds up in Mexico is five generations later. Talk about a GPS system <laughs> that went through DNA or the wonder of the good Lord here. It's, it's absolutely amazing and to do things with them and to see uh, the different larval species, to find eggs in these little growing on host plants. That's all very exciting for children. This spot, I mean, what a better view of looking out over the city um, to see through there and then to be able to take a space that literally looks like a parking lot in many ways and turn it into a beautiful pollinator garden is going to be spectacular. Uh, lots of work has gone into laying out the pathways, and that's kind of been the hold up so far is making sure we get, let's call it the infrastructure in, because we want this place to be very accessible for people. But this will be kind of the configuration. The parking lot is over to the left-hand side. This is Cecil Ashford right here. We'll do some screening of some sort um, throughout so that the cars are not quite as visible. And here again, the pathways, and then we'll begin to make it look like a beautiful meadow garden. It will not be a formal landscape. There will be times where it may look to many weedy. Now, I'll remind you on what the definition of the word weed is. Land out of place. There is no taxonomic definition. It just means something you didn't want somewhere. But it will be something that is in bloom from the beginning of the season all the way through winter throughout the years. And to be able to see the ch changes of the scenery is what I love in a garden anyway. So that's with the, the garden itself. And then we'll talk this last little bit about some of my favorite plants for pollinators. And what you're going to find through here, these are all native. These are all, um, and these will also be trees, shrubs, and perennials. And you'll again, the idea of having layers within your garden. This is all not something down at the 12 to 24 inch level. We want to have something as large as eventually 60, 80 feet tall down to the ground level, as it were. And I always start with red maple, and people just kind of look at you like, red maple is a pollinator plant? We grow red maple because we love the fall color. But red maple comes out with these beautiful red flowers, typically in March. We always are trying to figure out when in March it is, and if you're ever driving from the coast, Back up north, you can see the bloom progression as you're just driving along the interstate as these red flowers are peeking out. Bees love it. Bees are all over red maple because it's one of the first heavy blooms that we'll get in, let's call it, early, early spring. And so they are all over this plant. I love the bottle brush buckeye. This is a plant that blooms in the summer. See the big white bottle brush type flower? It's a large shrub, typically grows on the edge of the woodland, um, and it has spectacular yellow fall color. I'm a big sucker for fall color and fruits of some sort. So I want my plants to give me kind of double and triple duty. You know, a boxwood's a wonderful shrub. But a boxwood's kind of a boxwood is a boxwood all 12 months out of the year. I mean, it's what you get. New growth is a little lighter green than regular growth. That's the variation. Other shrubs, man, they may give us interesting winter structure, something like the oak leaf hydrangea and the orangey peeling bark. 
to flowers in the spring, to wonderful glossy foliage in the summer, to fruits that might be in June or maybe in October, to then fall color. They're changing all year long and I'm not having to do anything. It's doing it for me. So I really like the ones that do that. Here's a great perennial, Agastache, the hummingbird mint. Um, very tall, spiky plant. Wonderful array of colors. This will attract both hummingbirds and some butterflies will get in there with their long proboscis. Very drought tolerant, grows on very rocky soils. This to me is the tree we ought to be planting in, in, as we get rid of all the uh, flowering pears that are out there. <laughs> this is the service berry, Amelanchia, often called June berry. Uh, small understory tree, beautiful white flowers. <coughs> the fruits start out red and then will turn to kind of a blue black. It's called June berry <coughs> because the fruits mature in June, not October. And typically we don't see them very long because our fine feathered friends find this is a great delicacy. <coughs> so as again, we're gardening for wildlife, we're bringing birds into our landscape as well to come get that. And then as you can also see spectacular fall color. Now, if I asked you to do anything today, go home and plant some milkweed. That's for our monarchs. That's the larval host plant for the monarch butterfly. Um, typically, we're planting the one on the far right. That's Asclepias tuberosa. It is called milkweed. <coughs> it is native throughout most of the southeastern United States. We see it growing along the roadsides, uh, very poor, rocky soils, um, very tough plant. We have seven species of milkweed that we can grow within our region. It's hard to find most of them. The other two, I think I've got, this is swamp milkweed incarnata. The, uh, these other two tend to be a lot taller plants. So most of us in our home garden don't use them as much. In the pollinator garden, we'll make sure we have them. But you can see the pink flower here. Now it's also one interestingly, they will go to the flowers for nectar but only the monarch will lay its eggs on the plant and you'll find the eggs growing on the underside of the leaf. Yes, ma'am? How to best manage lupids on the Um, What did I say earlier? Don't use pesticides? <laughs> <laughs> Ladybugs love them. Ladybugs love them. So we're really working more and more. If I was in a greenhouse, um, we looked at our best management practices for greenhouse growing. We would, we would unleash ladybugs by the thousands as a biological control. We're doing a lot of research work now, how practical that is in the landscape, because it is a little more difficult. But you can buy ladybugs, and it's the nymph stage, not necessarily our little red shellback stage that we all think of as ladybugs. It's the stage before that, that eats them up. The other one is, get you a little spray bottle, um, you know, an empty shout spray thing, put an ounce of Dawn dishwashing detergent and a little bit of like vegetable oil in there and spray it with that. And that helps. <coughs> Soap is very good for sucking and chewing <coughs> insects, which aphids are, so it can work on that. Here's the other one. You can see they're much taller. Now, for a caterpillar, I'd much rather come eat this one because they've got big old fat leaves uh, that are there. That's the common norway. Asters are one of the largest group of native perennials you'll find in the whole eastern seaboard. Um, many different species, colors from whites to pink, but mostly known for the lavenders and purples and excellent for fall blooming. So that's why it's important to have the asters in your landscape. This is that time of the year when all your summer stuff is said, I've given up, I've, I've done my job. This is that bridge, especially as 
monarchs are migrating, that they need, or our bees are getting ready for winter and they're trying to stock up on that nectar. Fabulous shrub, Calicarpa. We plant it because of the purple berries. Well, we don't get the purple berries unless it gets pollinated. So bees and others love this when it flowers, not a very conspicuous flower. Most of you don't even see it, but we do see the fruits of that pollination. Red bud is another excellent pollinator, small flowering tree. This typically blooms after red maple. So as we're looking at that succession, we have red maple, red bud, service berry, kind of in that line of always having something in bloom. Most of the flowers are going to be this pinkish lavender. We've got one called Appalachian red now. We do have a beautiful white form. It's a white red bud. Sounds strange to say that. Uh, and then we have different foliage colors. Um, we now have the burgundies, we have the chartreuse, uh, and historically it's just the green. Another one of my favorites, the fringe tree, often called Grancy Graybeard or Old Man Fringe Tree. Beautiful fleecy white flowers. Now this one, notice the leaves are out, so it blooms a tad bit later than the other ones I just named, because it waits for the foliage to come out and then the white flowers will come. I didn't show you. It has these beautiful blue fruits that hang like grape clusters. Now, they hang kind of on the inside of the plant, so for us, we don't see them too much, but I can guarantee you that uh, other guys see them, and they're in there eating them up. Here's a great one called sweet pepper bush. If you've got a spot that's a little bit wet, this is an excellent plant. Native, can take a little bit of wet feet. Comes in whites and pinks, very fragrant, so we love it, just because of the fragrance in the garden. And then it gets this beautiful yellow fall color, kind of a golden yellow. There's a dwarf form called hummingbird, um, very floriferous. Uh, there's a new one out from Proven Winners called Vanilla Spice. You can imagine it's very, very fragrant. Another one that has, again, multi-season interest, the Winter King Hawthorne. White flowers, this could be another good substitute for the flowering pear. White flowers, the red fruits, and then I, I didn't have a picture of fall color. It does have good fall color. I probably hadn't put a garden in or designed one that didn't have cone flowers. Cone flowers and black eyed Susan are two staples, and they are pollinator friendly. So I'll just say that as well. You can't ever go wrong with those two. They work great in combination with each other. Uh, they take the same. Uh, site conditions and bloom around the same time. They're not all purple anymore. We have yellows and oranges and whites. You pick what you like. Uh, Joe weed, Eupatorium. This is a beautiful native, grows about six feet tall. The flowers will be as big as a small soccer ball, August and September. Typically, it's when the monarchs start migrating. So we'll see kind of, a, kind of a bank of them at the garden. You could go down there and there would be hundreds of monarchs on those plants as they started making their migration path. And here's that one for the winter interest. And this is gonna be for those bees that are hanging around our native bees or maybe something like the cloudless sulfurs that show up on warm days in the winter time. This is witch hazel. I love it. It's the yellow stringy flower, fringe type flower, and then spectacular fall color. Swamp sunflower. If there's not a plant that blooms its little heart out, on a six foot tall plant, I bet there's a thousand flowers on it. I mean, it is absolutely amazing in the fall of the year. Um, truly spectacular, and because of its stature, really sets itself off. Now, sometimes that's hard for us in a small garden to, to put in. But if you've got some space, put it at the back of the garden and let it grow up. It 
It's truly amazing. Our native hibiscus. Most of us think of hibiscus as what's in the Home Depot parking lot, you know, in the summer with the tropical looking flowers. Uh, this is the native one, hibiscus coccinius, and it um, is very hardy, dies back each year into the ground, and comes up. Our St. John's Ward, we see these all over Green Mountain and Montesano Mountain and others, beautiful yellow flowers, um, followed by the red fruits. And our hollies. Now, the neat thing about hollies is they are plants that have, we have male plants and female plants. They're what we call dioecious. It's a big word to use at a cocktail party sometimes, just to throw out there. When somebody asks you, you know, if you're made, or Republican or Democrat, say I'm dioecious. <laughs> But it, what's interesting about it, and of course, most of us want the female plant because we want berries. But we have to have a male somewhere to be able to get that pollinated. But these are wonderful plants for pollinators. When it blooms in the springtime, we've got hybrids. We've got the Native American holly. This is the deciduous holly, winterberry. And then our native yopon. This is the tree form yopon. Again, birds love them. So we're planning for both wildlife as well as, or the uh, bird life as well as the pollinators. Virginia sweet spire. This is in May. Beautiful white flowers. They drape over, um, very fragrant. And then again, look at the red fall color. Again, another big tree, Valeria dendron, our tulip poplar or yellow poplar. It's actually in the magnolia family. It's got a name like poplar and it's a magnolia. It's the problem with the common names out there that can fool you. But excellent plant for bees and uh, other pollinators. If you love hummingbirds, this is the honeysuckle of the plant. I'd almost say this is the only honeysuckle we plant. This is our native honeysuckle. Unfortunately, we have lots of non-native honeysuckle growing on all of our properties, land trust properties especially. But this vine starts blooming now. It's right when the scouts are coming through. So it's kind of a signature plant and uh, will continue to bloom throughout the summer. It can, this is the typical, the coral honeysuckle. We also have pure yellow and a deeper red. Now, Menarda. Menarda is a native plant. And back when it says plant natives, what I didn't read you under that is often what everybody says, the reason we plant natives is it's because it's from your area. We don't have to water them, not true. We don't have to spray them because they don't get any pests, not true. Native plants get pests just like everything else does. Native plants are native to a particular area. So if it's native to a wet spot in Madison County, we can't pick it up and try to grow it in a dry spot in Madison County. It was native to the wet spot. We can't take a plant that loves native to say Montesano Mountain in the understory of that limestone rock that drains well and put it in clay soil that used to be a cotton field in full sun. He's native, but he isn't happy. <laughs> so it's still right plant, right place. We've got to make sure we're matching that up. So pest resistance is a big issue. I don't want to spread. So I don't want to plant something that I know is going to get problems. Menarda for years, just like zinnias and just like phlox, gets powdery mildew in the deep south. We can't help it. It just eats it up. So our breeders, knowing that's a problem, have worked on disease resistance. So now we have selections of the native Menarda that are disease resistant. So I'm glad to have that back in the arsenal because it is an excellent long blooming season summer of um, pollinator plants. This probably is one of my favorite shade trees 
out there. It's the uh, black gum or tupelo tree, Nisa sylvatica. And it's a, the other one you'll see is um, the water tupelo, and often tupelo honey. That's what this comes from, where they're in tupelo swamps. The bees have all gone in there, and they can kind of isolate the honey that comes from here. Don't overlook the grasses. We don't think of grasses because they're not producing fruits, but they're excellent habitat, places to hide, places to overwinter in our gardens for the pollinators. They do have pollen, so sometimes that can be affected, but it's really more for the habitat. And then to me, from the landscape use, nothing better than the grasses flowing in the breeze. We get the sound, the movement, uh, great architectural features. I mentioned Rudecky already, the Blackout Susan, Salvius. Now, a lot of times people love that picture of the hummingbird because they always say, I thought I had to plant red to get hummingbird. Well, hummingbirds will go to red. Hummingbirds will go anywhere they get nectar. So I've seen plenty of them on blue flowers and other flowers. Here's some more of the bees all over the salvia. Gallardia, this is one that's a native wildflower, hot, dry conditions, all summer long bloom. And goldenrod, the guy, the poor thing, has got a bad reputation. You are not allergic to goldenrod. You're allergic to ragweed. Ragweed's the thug. Goldenrod's the nice guy. Bloom in the fall. We see them all over the roadsides and meadows and other spots. All the pollinators will go to them. Monarchs love them. For our gardens, we've gotten a few cultivars that are small fireworks and solar cascade. So I would recommend those to you from a small garden aspect. For the land trip of Levin's Gap property, we're gonna plant five or six different species because we have more area to put in and the different bloom times, different sizes. We want all of that to provide that much more um, diverse habitat that is there. But that's a beautiful fall bloomer that will come out. And then right when monarchs are migrating. Ironweed is again another big one. Our last shrub, the viburnum, or two, two viburnums that are native. These are May bloomers and look at that fall color. And then I love this one, the cranberry bush. It's kind of a um, lace cap type flower. So they'll land right on top. And then we plant it again for those beautiful red clusters of berries, which the birds love also. And then I mentioned the bad thug of um, honeysuckle. So we have to talk about wisteria. This is a native wisteria. This is wisteria frutescens. That's a good one. What we're seeing blooming everywhere right now is the Chinese wisteria, which has escaped and is definitely invasive. And that's what we don't want to plant. But this is a native vine. The reason nobody plants this is it doesn't grow very fast. It actually stays eight or 10 feet. Um, you can keep it even on a post or even on your mailbox where the other vine, somebody says, how tall will it grow and it's how tall is the tree or how tall you know if it's the tree's 100 feet tall it'll grow 100 feet so this is the much better one to grow i think we're about at 2 30. that's my email i'm always happy to answer any questions anybody might have if you'd like the presentation i'd be happy to send it to you i can do it as a pdf file so send me a note and i'll be happy to share that with you I'll hang around and answer questions. Thank you. I'll, I'll say two things. When Howie said, uh, join, join, that's the best thing to do with the land trust and get involved with their programs. I was fortunate, I was actually on the very first land trust board back in 1987, 88, I think it was. 
when we're trying to do Montesano, the preserve on Montesano. And uh, the other one, when you have Bob Barron up there, if y'all not heard Bob talk, that, that'll be a treat. <laughs> he's a <he's> character. Um, <laughs> and he has a lot to say. So uh, it will not be uh, a lot of dead air time. Yes, sir. Quick question. Uh, the, uh, no doctor. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, your, we, we got your older book. Yeah. You show me a picture of this book. There's some of this yeah. information in there. And the second question is this book. Well, the first, I, we have not updated the book. Um, so the book's the book. It's the first edition, first, well, we've printed it five times, but we've not done updates. Uh, book sales are not what they used to be. So my publisher is not real excited about spending a lot of money on an update. But the, um, so there are things I wish I could change, uh, you know, no question about it. When I wrote the book, Rose Rosette disease was not something we dealt with, and we definitely do now. I'd like to tell people that, as opposed to act like it doesn't exist. But follow us. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, we live probably about eight miles south of Rose Rosette. Yeah, one of okay. And so we have deer. And they're going to have deer. Are you fencing them out? Are you, are you, how are you, how are you handling that, sir? They're good. I mean, if they come, they come. Um, and I'm sure they will. You know, when that's the other problem with native plants, guess what? Deer, deer, deer want them because that's what they eat as well. There will be some the deer won't bother, there'll be others that the deer will. Deer are interesting, um, they'll eat when they're hungry and when they can't find other food. So hopefully there's enough with all the other green spaces around with the preserve out there that they're very content with what they have. I gotta say they're not gonna wander up there and see what the hell's going on. Uh, they probably will. That's a good view for them too. Uh, sit out there. Do you have any kind of resistance? I was bringing up all the, all the stuff on the internet. Um, that's that's a maintenance issue. Um, I doubt we will at first. If we find we've got a problem in, with a certain plant that we just can't keep, then I'm, I can see trying some deterrents. All the deterrents work until they don't. <laughs> just it. I mean, they all work at some point until they don't. Yes, sir. Yeah, what's, uh, how, how are you going to handle your Water source up there. That's, that is a good question. <laughs> the um, first and foremost, I will say we try to, and with a garden of this nature and with the plant material picked out, the intent is once it's established, it can take care of itself. It's a sustainable garden. There'll be times we go through long periods of drought that you may have to do some supplemental water. But the intent is not to have a garden that has to be bathed. Now, that being said, no garden is drought tolerant when you put it in the ground. It has to get to the point of establishment. So the first season is the most important to get the plants established so the root systems are out and they're able to find water as it becomes available. With that in mind, the very best time for you to plant, I'm just giving you generalities, is the fall. Because your roots have a chance to grow. They grow as long as the soil is above 40 degrees. And in Alabama, that may be Christmas. The top of the plant will go dormant after the first freeze when the temperature drops. So the top's kind of telling the roots, I don't need anything. You kind of do what you want to do. So the root says, fabulous, I don't have to deal with him. I'll start growing, and also after we get through Halloween, we get plenty of rainfall. September and October are very dry, but November, December, January are very wet. So that's we're kind of working through those those machinations. So you're not going to bring an irrigation system. Right? At, at this point, it's proving problematic. I'll just put it that way. But there there could be a um, we'll call it a water tower cistern of some of that, or a way we can supplement it. How do you get to it? Straight up, Cecil. Actually, access, there, right? yeah, access is wonderful. 
because it is not something. I mean, if you think, but how is pictures? I mean, we live in a city. I mean, major now the biggest city in Alabama that has state parks, lake, I mean, preserved spaces in the city. We're not talking about driving out of town. It's right here. That, that's phenomenal. It really is. So Ashford has cars, so. Yeah, they just turn off. On, I mean, it's a very big parking lot. It's already there. Yeah, the parking lot's already there for the trailhead. And this is just the section that's not. And they'll have lights so they can see the grass. Yeah, there, well, <laughs> there's no wall. Yeah, no, you can only go in one side. Yes, sir. Just a hypothetical question. We were, we were put in a you know, small manor garden at our house to draw the, the bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, not using any pesticides, whatever. But our neighbors did use pesticides. Does our drawing more of the bees and butterflies subject them to a net gain or a net loss given the environment around yeah. our garden from the neighbors? Hypothetically, um, <laughs> it, all, it, it truly all depends on what pesticides they're using and how they're transmitted. If, if the bees are, or, and pollinators are visiting their plants as much as visiting your plants, then yes, the potential is there. If, because uh, in getting it from nectar, most of the issues come from spraying, which means drift. And if they're not spread, you know, that's why I say it depends on what pesticides it's there. That's why also years ago, mosquitoes, our mosquito spraying's at night. They're, it's at night for a reason. Most all the pollinators, bees are up. What's scary is when Zika virus came out and they had that other mosquito and the first pictures they showed down in South Florida, middle of the day, they're out in the streets, just fogging the streets to kill the Zika mosquito, which is a public health problem. But consequently, now we're having to deal with, okay, what else is it killing because of everything that's out there? What's the ads now, you know, to, to hey, come on and real deep mosquito. Yeah. Is, is that a bad spray? Or? Um, you have to get into the weeds again of what they're using. If it's a, in most cases, it is something that would impact if it's sprayed directly or if it's sprayed on the plants? Plant, it, the contact, it, again, it, it all depends on what we call residual. Um, and for most mosquito sprays, there's not a long residual. That's why the foggers come in and they're killing what's right there. Really they went under the branches. Yeah, they're trying to get everything they can find. So it's going to impact other uh, insects. But they are having to deal with EPA. EPA is getting involved, so we'll have some rulings from that. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. Um, so I don't really care what my lawn looks like, but my husband insists upon having true green thumbs. Um Now, what is I don't know, you know what is how is true green? Should I should I should I, should I get in a fight with my husband and tell him we're not having it anymore? <laughs> these are these are the domestic disputes I get called. <laughs> To more marriage counseling than it is. <laughs> I, it, it's, a, it's a conundrum. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, we have areas of the country. There's, it's about true green, and I don't want to pick on true green, it's about lawn care companies yeah. spraying what they're using to, to have Augusta National Golf Course in your home. And it, the balance of that. And um, I mean, they're playing Canada has really come close to banning that. And, you know, that is, so I mean, it, there's a battlefield out there along this. Of course, the, the turf industry in our country is a multi, multi-million dollar industry. They're gonna fight it like to, to ban. Now, they ought to be working to say, we're gonna do this in the most ecologically beneficial way. And I would slap their hands if they didn't say that. There's a there's a happy medium, and it's just working with them to get to that. And I have another quick question. Yeah. Where do I get? I I, I just first dug up my garden. I'm ready for plants. Where do I purchase pollinator 
I, it has become, I would say, one of the easiest marketing messages we as an industry have had. So everybody now, every independent garden center, every store has a section on pollinate, or the tag itself will say pollinator friendly. And neither, neither. Yes, and then they'll even with negatives. Those are the two biggest trends. Please go if you want to get up and go here. I know I tend to talk a lot, and we kept you here a long time, but so don't feel like you need to stay. Like you did like a Joe Pie lead somewhere. So, yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Come on, go. Um, concerning spiders, we haven't even mentioned spiders. Have you been to the spiders in gardens? Um, yep, they definitely eat other bugs. <laughs> they bug us more than, you know, they're beneficial in that sense. We get freaked out because of brown recluse and black lily. Um, but most typically, garden spiders are catching other. Now, the, for me in the butterfly house, we hate it because they would catch butterflies. So my spider webs are catching my butterflies that I paid four bucks for. So I'm, we're out there knocking spider webs down right and left because we didn't want them having free lunch while that's Yeah. So, but, but yeah, it's pretty, really neat. yeah, they're fine. They're part of the biodiversity. You want to answer that? <laughs> How do you harvest swamp tupelo tree honey? Uh, the hives are on the dry land, not far away. Which means flies the tupelo, they come back and they harvest the normal way. So you, you've located a hive near a tupelo swamp so that you know when that tree is in bloom, it is a major attractor. So those bees are going there. They kind of don't say, you know, the Smiths over here have some golden rod. It wouldn't be golden rod, but Ruth Becky, but they're all going to the Tupelo trees because they know they're in bloom. So when they come back, that's what they brought to the high. Now, is it 100% pure Tupelo? Probably not. But you, those guys that do the honey will see it and they can say, this is, too, and we do sourwood honey that way, we do clover. Honey, when people say this is clover honey, it's because the hives were near a field of clover and they're fairly confident that almost all the nectar they and pollen they grab was from that clover field. So does the city go in like to Margaret Ann's uh, <laughs> place and put hives so that they can... City know? does. There might be some beekeepers that have access to it. Or have permission. Yeah. Why are the Joneses raising mustards? You've been just fine. Mustards. Oh, that man sent mustards. Yeah. Interesting. And you took those fields and you go, mustard. You know, at one time they grew more fescue seed than anyone else in the country back in the 50s. Uh, mustards are a fabulous um, crop. I mean, we've you've got, uh, I don't know if they're harvesting the greens. It is a deep rooted plant, so it can, what we would call a sod buster, as far as tilling the soil, being a biological plow. Um, I haven't noticed that. I'll, I'll sure call them, because I'd love to know. He, they do a lot of things, uh, especially in the farm up on Princeton, um, that's very interesting. So I didn't, I've not seen the mustard field. Thank you. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Without a doubt. Now, I can't believe that slide. That's a slide you draw. Okay. Because <laughs> when I went past them, I'm not sure there's a red buckeye slide in there or something. But yes, red buckeye is an excellent. Uh, small flowering tree that and hummingbirds love. Okay, we're gonna have to bring it up. They're gonna throw me out. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Thank you.